It's time to awaken the king. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. This is where ordinary entrepreneurs come for inspiration and education to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes until the job gets done. Look, when I made the leap from corporate America to running my own business, I had a wife, five kids, a mortgage, and they all wanted to eat and sleep in warm beds. I didn't have the luxury of hitting rock bottom while I found myself on my buddy's couch or in somebody's basement or going back home. Oh, no. I had to put food on the table, a lot of food on the table, every single day, every week, every month. This is the no hype, cut to the chase, material ideas and training I wish I had when I started down my entrepreneurial journey. This is one of the premier sales, marketing, and entrepreneurial programs available, and it's free. Make sure to stay up to date on everything I'm working on, along with additional content I don't have time to share on the podcast by signing up for the Weekly Whisper at weeklywhisper.com. If you're curious about where to start when it comes to taking control of your sales and marketing is just selling in print, you can get my sales agenda to use in your everyday sales life at thesalesagenda.com. Finally, get the on-demand help you need to grow your sales at 30daysalesgrowth.com. Enter the promo code PODCAST to save a few bucks on your order. If you have any questions on ways I might be able to help you here with my team at The Sales Whisperer, feel free to email me, Wes, at thesaleswhisperer.com. That is my actual email address. Now on to the show. Greg W. Anderson. Author of what? Several things, right? The the Selfish Divorce, uh, The Architect you're known as. You've got to Awaken the King Academy. Uh, a lot of things to talk about, man. So welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? Thanks, Wes. I'm actually doing really good. And yeah, I've, uh, I've done three books so far, but The Selfish Divorce was the last one. This was the first time I stepped outside of the business realm, right. outside of financing and marketing. So it was uh, a little unique, but yeah, that was that was the last one. Uh, fourth book uh, should be done this fall. Oh, man. Well, I want to get into all that, but before we do, I've got to say, I ran across you uh, when I was in one of my snarkier moods, and you must be the most uh, laid-back, patient, uh, peace-loving dude I've run across in years. You just responded with grace, and I was like, holy cow, who is this guy? <laughs> so uh, I wanted to have you on because you've got the, you know, should we jump into the awakening right now? I mean, that that, that really kind of rocked my world, seeing what you're doing with that, awakenthekeng.net. Uh, but I know, I mean, you're a CEO, you've got a couple of businesses, you know, kind of, I don't know if we have enough time in the day, but can you kind of take us back to the beginning kind of quickly, like how you got started and, and how you how you came to, to launch this new program? Sure. So I started... Corporately, um, banking, you know, as I was getting out of the banking market in 2005 and opening my own companies, which was really my first turn at in, uh, entrepreneurship, um, I went straight through the gamut of the companies and corporate consulting. And, and where I am today was kind of, you know, my own rabbit hole. Through corporate consulting, I learned one thing, that if I sat in a room with 13 people, I inevitably had to step on somebody's toes. If they wanted <laughs> me to teach them how to do business better... Somebody else, I was finding a hole or that was my specialty and not theirs. Yep. And so I didn't like it. I got out of it and you know, through my own software company, I own a company that we do lots of lead generation for different companies, Comcast Cable or whomever. You move to a new house, you're going to get some direct mail pieces or you're going to get some <laughs> email pieces from us. Uh, but it really wasn't kind of the passion. I, I went through my second divorce through the mix of all of this and I spent a few years. I didn't have was I was lucky enough not to be broke. So I spent a few years trying to figure out myself and why I was so good at when it came to marketing and sales, but horrible when it came to communication and a relationship. Right. That's basically where the selfish divorce was born from. Uh, and after that, I was able to rebuild my relationship with my ex and her new husband really, really well. We're taking a trip in a couple of weeks to Austin, all together as a family. Um, and, you know, I got a lot of response from that. Guys asking me, like, you know, I, I know I kick ass at business, but I'm horrible on these other things. How do I get better? That's a 35-foot, 1,000-foot flyover to <laughs> Awaken the King because I realized Awaken the King is a, is a kind of a mentorship, a boot camp that I put together for men. Uh, I get coaches and trainers, consultants, um, 
you know, guys that own HVAC companies or even plastic surgeons that are saying, I do really well at business, but because of my home life as a wreck, I can't figure out how to get any better. Mm-hmm. So I built that program based on my own expertise and my own experiences on if I can't handle my body, my physical body, my being, which is spirituality, my business, and my balance, you know, my family, I can't do any better. I go to work and I think about my kids. I go home to play with my kids and I think about work. Right. All of that was how to strengthen these things and, and kind of straighten this up in life. So that's kind of the, uh, the quick rundown to Awaken the King. But that's about a 15-year stint of time and Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and all of the other greats that I'm sure you've been through as well and read and trying to understand yourself better. This was just a compilation of how does marketing work in business and how does it work with your kids or your wife? It's the right. same thing. So, you know, I'd love to talk about business, but man, I, I think what you hit on is, is just so important. You know, if people get themselves right, would you say everything else kind of falls into place? Yeah. We spend about 80% of everything we do. When people come, come stay, stay with me for two or three, four days, we run through a boot camp. But 80% of everything we do is about the person or individual giving themselves some new tools or trying to make the dominoes click in the head. Um, and then the rest is how do we polish off some marketing? How do we, how do we sell people or how do we communicate our message more clearly, more honestly, so we get more customers? But the majority of the time, it's, it's all just personal breakthrough. It's how do I get my head right? right. You know, how do I stop my porn addiction or my drug addiction? Or you know, how do I stop distancing myself from my wife every time we have financial problems when all I really want her to do is love me anyway. It's just all these weird things that go on in guys' heads. Right. Do, do you think, um, I mean, we've, everything's, we've just been lied to. I mean, is everything like left is right, right is wrong, up is, up is down. I mean, and, <gasps> and that just gets everybody messed up? No, it's kind of like they just gave us a jigsaw puzzle and threw it on the ground without a map. Right. You know, if I didn't see what that picture looked like, I'd have a really hard time connecting all my dots. And so I think there's a lot of things, you know, when you're talking politics and world and the way that we were raised without knowing any financial um, awareness of money, credit cards, debt, you know, as far as traditional school is concerned, not, right. not, we're, 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 we're not prepared for this life. Right. But in general, I just think that nobody's really tried to construct the map well enough or the, the picture of the puzzles. All the pieces are there. We just keep putting them in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. Does it take hitting rock bottom to figure this out? Because I know that's that's part of your message. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what we were talking about earlier. I mean, it seems like a lot of people, obviously, when you hit rock bottom, you have nowhere to go, nowhere else to go but up, right? But, man, is there a way to not hit rock bottom and figure this stuff out? Yeah, the majority of the guys that come through the program aren't at rock bottom financially. They might be emotionally broke, like you know, on the brink of divorce or they've cheated on their wife or something. That's their rock bottom. But you know, traditionally we think rock bottom is just money. But it costs money to, you know, come out and they invest in themselves and they start, you know, rebuilding their kind of their mental image of themselves. You know, when we were out of our 20s and 30s and you started making money, you looked in the mirror and you were this like, you know, Greek God that was amazing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have a few hardships and maybe you have some fights and a few bad years and that starts to crack. And so what we say to ourselves and how we view ourselves kind of starts to crumble. It's not necessarily a rock bottom situation, but it is a place where there's some pain and you're willing to do what's for, what, what's required. Uh, very rarely do I have somebody come through the program that's in their 20s and, and has no hardships. Right. Maybe their business is great and their marriage. Something has had to give because I just don't see that many people in my own personal life that um, have always been running smoothly and have never wanted to to reach or push for more. There's always something going on, but it doesn't have to be money. Right. It could be something else. Right. And are you working like with small groups or just a big group? Or You know, primarily what happens now is somewhere between once a month, somewhere between three and eight guys fly either to Utah or Austin, Texas, where I put these on. Um, we run through about a four-day boot camp, and these are long hours, long days, um, put together with a very specific way. In the first probably four or five hours, um, I'm really there just to kick the heck out of people. I run through three CrossFit workouts back to back to back. <laughs> Not meant to kill somebody, but it's meant so that they have to lean on the other guys that are there. Right. 
And I can tell through your body in about 20 minutes where you want to mentally quit. But if I sat in a room and debated with you for three, four hours or six days, we'd have a really hard time overcoming like where we're really honestly at. And so we run through these, these, these programs are not meant to, you know, be a five day seminar and then walk away with some rah, rah. It's like, I really meant to boot camp style military, break you down, you know, to help you find where those weakest links are and rebuild it up. Yeah. So small groups, not, that, not really large. That reminds me, you know, I got the name of sales whisperer from watching the dog whisperer and he'd always say exercise, then discipline, then affection. And it sounds like you're yes. doing the same thing, right? <laughs> yes. We build what we'd call your routine or your, you know, what your ritual that you do in the mornings. You look at a professional athlete and they go to the game and they don't go cold. They don't just show up and play. They've warmed up. They've probably mentally meditated on what they were going to do. They've ate or eaten the right kind of food. They've done all these things to make sure that they're on point when they show up. So part of all of this structure and making sure our body, like we do something to cause us to sweat, exercise every day, is so that we can feed that kind of crazy beast that's inside. I call him the dark warrior. He's the guy that if you just sit on the couch all day, wants to tear everybody apart and just yell at everybody. We we'll feed that guy. That's the ego. Work out in the mornings. And then there's certain things that we study and journal. Meditation is part of something that we teach. It's also that when we show up to work, we're actually there to work. We can get, you know, eight hours of traditional, I'm kind of half assed work done in one to two hours if we're super focused. Right. It's just that. It's take care of the family so that I don't have to think about that while I'm at work. All yeah. kinds of components. It's all that. That's what they say. You, you go to work, you think about your family. You go to family, you think about your work, and you're never really totally present, huh? Yeah, it is. You could be working at your home and sitting in front of your laptop, and you know you need to write an email copy or email somebody, and all of a sudden Facebook pulls up and Twitter, and and then you go to Google, and there's ten other windows open, and this is kind of like our unexercised mind. You know, it's just like, well, I don't know what to do. People get yeah. frozen in fear. It's all just about exercising. It's one of the reasons we teach meditation. Really, really, really simple. It's, it's the same thing as you know your, your bicep. If you don't work it out, it goes kind of haywire. All we want to do is be able to think of one thing at a time. Right. So uh, do, do you get into like some of the nitty gritty of just like time planning and scheduling and, and things like that? Anything you can share? Yeah, by the time we're done, this is how this works. Everybody's individual because they have unique companies, they have unique lifestyles. So it's all person for them. But I can give you what my routine is. My routine starts at about 630 because I know that I want to be productive by about 830. And in the midst of that, I wake up, I drink my bulletproof coffee. That's just an organic coffee that I like. Um, I get ready. I go to the gym. That's just to work out, trying to get the blood pump in the body right. I come home and there's two styles of books that I study every day. One is something spiritual and that could be scripture or it could be uh, something even like a self-help book, something that opens my horizons a little bit more. And the other is going to be business, sales, marketing, or automation. It's the only three things I study. And how I do this is this. I break it down and I read my book until I get one aha moment. I don't read for time. I don't read for content because I'm dyslexic and I will never remember my fifth aha moment. I remember <laughs> the first and the last. And then I open my journal and I write down what they said. And then I write down, how would I use this in my life? Just takes it from short-term memory, reading it, long-term memory by recalling it. And then I, when I paint it into my life by saying, how would this uh, apply to myself? I actually switch the other side of the brain into the creative side and I store what I just learned. Instead of just knowledge for knowledge's sake, this is actually stored memory. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I, I lay down, I put my headphones on, I meditate for about 20 minutes. And after that, I'm ready for the day. Wow. You know, I, I learned a lot from Dan Kennedy. You know, he talks about discipline equals responsibility equals discipline. Yeah. You know, or maybe vice versa, responsibility equals discipline equals responsibility. But either way, you know, you get the point. But, and that's, and I keep adding more discipline to my life. But, and I realize when I get the most scattered or not most frustrated, tired, unproductive, I look around, it's like everything's a mess. I haven't stuck to a schedule. Uh, yeah. So would you say, I mean, that's, that's kind of one of the hidden keys is just, is having that structure versus just kind of winging it and taking whatever comes your way? 
It is. I mean, we could look at anything from business and they're looking at finances and your profit and losses, or we could look at baseball. You win baseball games by hitting base hits. It's not grand. You know, once in a while you hit a home run. I mean, the guys that make a lot of money, you know, he strikes out more often. And not all the time is he helping his team win, those big bombers. But they hit base hits every day, and they're small. And all they care about is get on base, get on base. So most of the things that we do are small things that can be done in like 10, 20 minutes. But it is a structure because once I know my key, my my structure of how I feel strong and how I feel motivated – I know that if I don't do it that day, I might not feel motivated, but it's my choice. It's kind of the difference between an addiction of waking up, you know, craving something versus waking up or a habit versus addiction. Habit is, as I wake up and I tell myself, I have to work out today. Like, ah, man, I have to work out. I need to work out. And an addiction is I wake up and say, if I don't work out, I'm going to feel like crap. And so we're just trying to build in small little addictions and they are structured in a way that I know I can feel in power and my brain works right. You know, people, my family loves me. You know, I start getting cranky and the first thing they do is, have you worked out today? You know, <laughs> go for a jog. And it, it's just go or go meditate for 10 minutes. Like I can't stand you right now. Right. And they even know what my habits are, my routines are. Right. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I noticed too, you've been talking about, you just voluntarily gave up drinking, right? Yeah. Just to, just to test it? I mean, what, what led just that and, and what have you seen? It's been, what, a few weeks? Yeah, it's been almost about six, to, so almost eight weeks now. Oh, wow, okay. Um, seven weeks, sorry. So what had happened is, is I deal with a lot of guys across the board, um, some that have you know, addictions, some that have anger issues, some that just are just normal guys. And I kind of feel like if I haven't experienced something, how do I teach it? You can track all the way back to Christ. When, when, when he went through, you know, what he went through and he bled and he was put up on the cross, resurrected, he went through so that he could feel and understand and have empathy. And if I don't know what it's like to be sober, how can I possibly help somebody that has a drug addiction problem? I can tell him where to go and how to help, but I don't have really empathy to say, well, what do you do when you crave something? Like the minute I stopped drinking, I started craving sugar like crazy. I'm just trying to, you know, re- replace one, you know, addiction with another. And, and it led to all kinds of weird things in my head that I haven't explored in years. Mm-hmm. Um, but really it was, you know, I, I don't know what it's like. And I don't, I'm not a heavy drinker. You know, maybe it's a couple times a week or maybe it's once a week. It just depends on the, cir- the circumstances. But it's also was a new experience for me to actually go out and be a part of the world and not drink in a world of drinkers. There's nothing wrong with being a drinker, but you know, the first thing the guy asks if I if I walk into, let's say I was going to a, a nightclub or out to a nice dinner, and a lot of people, you know, uh, a bar type setting, a lot of people communicating and hanging out, and somebody asks me if I want to drink, and I say no, and I tell them the reason why, and the next thing that comes out of his mouth, maybe four to five times a night when I'm out, is you know I've been thinking about trying this for a long time. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it's like, and so it was just something that. Is an experiment. Maybe I'll get thinner. Maybe I'll get more clear. Maybe I won't get anything at all except <laughs> the fact that I know I did something for a year that's not normal. Right. Yeah, just last week I just started uh, cutting out sugar. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. And it's hard. Good grief. I'd rather give up drinking. <laughs> <laughs> sugar is everywhere. It is. Oh my gosh! So we'll. I haven't killed anybody yet. So I'm about five days into it. So we'll. I like it. <laughs> we'll see. I like it. Here's my trick for sugar. I eat fruit and vegetables yep. in the morning, whether I make a green smoothie or whatever. As long as I eat fruit and a good portion of it, I don't crave it at night. Oh, if wow. I do, if I don't, if I miss my orange or my apple in the morning and another one or two at lunch, yeah. then I want to open a huge pound of Hershey's chocolate bar mm-hmm. and rip through that and dip it into peanut butter and eat the whole thing. Yep. I mean, that's just how bad my cravings are. Wow. So, so have they have they calmed down a bit or are you still, the sugar crave still intense? The sugar craving is still there. It's kind of like the routine. I know how to manage it, but I also know at 8 o'clock if I haven't done it right, then I'm in trouble. Yeah. So all of this is just kind of, you know, it's, it's fighting instant gratification. Um, you know, one thing that we did in the program is I, it, it teaches a lot with guys that have kids. You know, I, a couple of years ago, a friend asked me, what would I do or what's the one life lesson if I were to die next year? What's the one life lesson I would want my kids to learn uh, through that? And how would you teach it? So I did some research and study and I, you know, read the marshmallow theory 
few years back, and the marshmallow theory was this: during Harvard, uh, uh, yeah, Harvard put together a, uh, a study in the '60s where they put a marshmallow in front of a five-year-old, and they took about 600 of them. Oh yeah, said, I remember. You, yeah, if you eat it, it's yours, no problem. If you wait for five minutes, you get two. Yep. Um, and then they tracked the people that that didn't fight the instant gratification, the kids, and they had made all, you know hundred thousand dollars more on average. Their marriages lasted longer, and all of they built this down is to instant gratification, which is basically just trying to feed cravings, shopaholic, buying cars, you know, sugars, whatever it is. It's just how do I fix feed these instant gratification pieces? So I'm in the long and the short sense of the drinking. It's really taught me that there's a lot of things that. I've wanted to just feed myself. I want to gratify myself. And I'm just trying to hold back a little bit, be right. more a little bit reserved. Oh yeah, that's cool. I haven't I haven't heard of that in a while, but yeah, it was that was really interesting. Uh so all right, let's shift a little bit about business. So people yes. that are listening that may want some some tangible nuggets, maybe. I like talking to people that are authors, uh, because mm-hmm. I keep pounding on people. You gotta write a book, you gotta write a book. Um, you know, A, would you agree with that, you know, for business owners, even salespeople and, and B, can you kind of talk about how, how you've gone about writing your books and, uh, are there any tips, shortcuts people could use, uh, to get their first one done? Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, credibility that comes back with being an author. Um, there's a lot of places, doors that open because you did it, even if you self-published it and it was just the fact that you did it because so many people talk about it. Now, the biggest shortcut I could give somebody that has limited time and um, maybe not – this one might cost, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars over a year's period of time. But if you've got a good idea and you're not somebody that's a structured writer, go to Elance, elance.com, hire a ghost writer, somebody that will work with you every week, not somebody that's going to write a book for you. Or you get on a Skype call every week and you say, this is what I want this chapter about, and they have – um, they have a background in that history, whether it's psychology or sales or whatever. Oh, and for, there, there goes my alarms. Oh, uh, ne- next, I want you to give me tips on how to get <laughs> smoke detectors. Uh, we cannot find the bad one. Oh, well. I That's digress. all right. That's all right. All right. So work with you weekly. <laughs> yeah, work with you weekly and just try to kick out a chapter every week to two weeks. Um, you know, I, I've, I've helped a lot of people, attorneys, uh, other guys that have said, I need something to be able to give my clients. Um, and I, I, I don't have the time. So we've just set this up where we have a weekly call for an hour to two. This is what we want to do. And there are a lot of very, very talented writers that know the structure of books and the reason or, or of, of writing. And the reason that most people don't finish is because they do one or two chapters and they think, I'm not writing this correctly, so I'm going to quit. Yeah. So it has to be scheduled has to be something that you're willing to schedule out every week. Um, and that's the fastest way to do it. If not, if they're going to write it themselves, schedule it. Put it in your planner. Yeah. Give yourself a set time. You know, Make sure that you do all the ritual routines to get you in creative mode. And just write it every week, even if you write two or three lines. Right. If you can get past the first like two months, yeah. it's golden. Um, you know, I, I'm just starting to experiment with outsource writers because I'm a writer and I just, oh, it's so hard. Somebody gives me something. I look at it. I'm like, no way, you know? So, I mean, did writing come easy to you or now after several books, has it become easier or are you still relying on people to help you, you know, get over the hump and, and meet the deadlines? So there's, there's one person in particular that I still use, um, pretty regularly. And what I did is I interviewed a lot of people cause I did the same thing. You know, I went through different writers and nothing really connected. So instead of um, looking and just posting something when I went to Elance and found uh, the specific doctor that I work with now, I went through and I just started interviewing like I would interview jobs. And I found somebody with the right background that we communicated with, that we got along with. And now it's, it's more of a give and take. Uh, if I need something done and I don't have the time, I can speak to Howard we can go over it, but he always submits it, and I submit my changes back, and we, we've got a, a good process. It's like having a really good executive assistant. It doesn't come really easy off the bat. They just don't know how you operate and think. But with timing, and if you're willing to put in the effort, then absolutely. But again, you're also paying for having quality people. It's not a $15 an hour or, or $15 article that we're writing. It's you know something that I'm I'm actually trying to give value back into the world. So I had to look at it like that as well. Yeah. How, how do they find your voice? You know, I mean, when you're talking about something, 
because uh, that's what I'm grappling with, you know, yeah. is how do they, I, mean, I say things differently. I throw in humor, you know, I throw in stories. Uh, I throw in, you know, I make up words, <laughs> you know, I mean, does it just come with time? They just, they learn your style. Well, for those that are viewing this on YouTube, I have my phone <laughs> and a microphone in my hand. Um, I use voice notes yeah. almost consistently. So if I'm writing out a chapter or an idea, instead of just typing it, I might do several different sections of voice notes on what that's going to be. And I send them to them so they can catch how I speak and catch my voice. And also I communicate better when I'm speaking than I do when I'm writing. And so I use a mix of both, but it's the storyline and the story is just off of my iPhone and voice notes. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you use uh, Dropbox? I use Dropbox or Google, depending on Google Drive, depending yeah. on who, what they use. Um, account for both. Uh, like both of them. And, you know, with your iPhone, you can upload it right to Dropbox from where you're sitting at and share it. Yeah, there's an app, uh, and it's, it's Drop uh, V-O-X. Okay. So you may want to check it. I think it's like a $5 app. And so it's to take specifically uh, voice notes. Oh, perfect. Throw them straight to, uh, to Dropbox. Awesome. I'll so, look into uh, it for sure. I got to write that down. I got to make sure. I <laughs> That's right. Put those in the notes. That's a good uh, note to take. So, so your first book, so your first three or first two were on business and marketing, right? And then you came out um, with the, I'm drawing a blank, the divorce, selfish, selfish divorce. divorce. Yes. Uh, so what, so most people are listening, I mean, are in business or in sales. Uh, what kind of inspired you or gave you the confidence that, hey, I'm somebody that can be an author? It, it happened because I made a Facebook post about three years ago of myself, my ex-wife, my two kids, and her new husband, uh, Easter. Um, and I'm super proud that she found an amazing man and it worked out well. And I made a post of all of us and said, hey, you know what? We, went, we had a divorce, but you know, we navigated the minefields and we got through it. And a huge response came from that. And a friend of mine who's a publisher contacted me and said, hey, I just think you should write it because it's a good message. And it, it kind of led the, ro the, the way. When we teach business now, we teach about four concepts. And, and I can kind of map this down if it's my personal life now or if it's business. And it's, it's be real, which is what's the honest truth. Be raw, which is what's the emotional connected to it. Be relevant. That's the whys. And what's the result you want? Well, the selfish divorce was written on this concept. Well, I, my divorce went through because of this concept, and then the book came from it, which is, what do I ultimately want? Two people are separating. There's, you know, it's, they, they're not going to reconcile. They're happening. Well, most of the time we get stuck in our head because we want to fight and create conflict. He said, she said, I want, whatever. But they never really look at the big picture. This is the same in business. What's my 10-year goal or my five-year goal? So it, and this I looked at it and said, what do I want? Well, I want my kids to come out of it as easy as possible with as less drama. I want my ex to be able to move on as fast as possible and find somebody without all of this baggage and turmoil. So when I started looking at the long-term scope of things, every decision was made based on those concepts. I don't want to cause conflict. I don't want to cause fight. Now, it wasn't just, you know, here's the, here's the world and, and I'm going to go around and shy. I'm going to be really honest with my intentions and because of that, I can, you know, have better conversations with her about how this moves forward. So everything kind of, kind of dominoed and the whole, that book premise was written just about how to get really honest with yourself on what you want. And then how do you move on? Well, how do you get that result? And so it, to answer your question, it was just because of a Facebook post and it worked well and people liked it. And I thought, you know, what? that's a good idea. I'm going to explore that. And I spent the next six months to a year writing it now. I didn't write every day. You know, you think of, of a writer sitting down and, you know, writing and, and the whole world gets shut off because he's sitting in a cabin somewhere. Uh, it was little bits at a time. Yeah. Cool. Consistent little bits at a time. I'll throw <laughs> that in. <laughs> so would you say you did that one more on your own than, than with the help of a writer? Or did you still have a writer help you? So because of um, this was more of a, an emotional and personal development, I had my ghostwriter helped me as well. What we did is, is I, I can run a, a one, two, three, four, five step on learning how to short sell a home. But when it came to 
a little bit more psychology and communicating to that and in, in, in some of these aspects. Um, I definitely used Howard, one of my writers, a lot on this, mainly for the formatting. Um, and when we did some research, I had him help me with, you know, concepts of going, finding other doctors that say the same style of things and adding those into the footnotes because I didn't want to doing that research wasn't my specialty and right. I didn't necessarily want to do it. So the format and this flow and the style was me, but then making sure fact checking and making sure that we had right components in there. Definitely him. He was invaluable on it. Yeah, that's cool. So how'd you get all this media coverage? I'm a really good marketer. <laughs> <laughs> so my style has always been, or, my, or, or one of my expertises is learning how to get people to either buy or see you, right? So when I was hired as a corporate consultant, I would go into a company and they would have me go in and find out how do we get a higher conversion rate from a guy clicking on the blue button to which way the arrow points on his opt-in or his buy page. And I could get a half a percent more people to actually buy something. When you're a hundred million dollar company, a half a percent is a lot. And then it was, how do we get our banking to work a little bit better? How do we communicate these small little tweaks um, and because of that, I had a lot of great experience with that, but I always did it in the corporate atmosphere. So when I finally decided to do it for me, I just started going out in the same channels. If I wanted media coverage in a very specific website, I would buy it because it's there. It's, it's like buying your way into a magazine or, you know, if you want to be a number one bestseller on the New York or the New York times, there's two ways to do it. Come up with a amazing idea or spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and buy it. It's just how that game works. And you're not buying your own books, but you're buying the placement for your books so other people will buy them. So once I come up with or, or came out to that, it was realizing that there's a lot of footwork I needed to do and there was a lot of, uh, of places where I wanted to buy the media coverage as well. And again, that's not paying somebody off a check saying print this about me. It's just making sure I'm placed in the right places. Yeah, and that was – it's still a little disheartening to me because when I learned that little secret – I was like, really? These people, you know, sure, there's some that are earth shattering and just make it. But most people that I've seen that are New York Times best selling, they spent the money. And, and several of them I've spoken with are like, I won't do that ever again. Yeah. You know, it's like, ugh. and it almost comes full circle, right? Like, kind of, it's some of the problem that the men and women, and also, but I mean, you work more with men, but we have these unrealistic expectations, right? It's like, I'm a good author, let's say, how come I'm not a New York Times bestseller? Then you realize, oh, hell, the deck, you know, the deck is stacked against us. If I don't have $200,000, I may not be. Right. Right. And then once the scales fall out of the eyes, right, it's like, okay, then I don't have to feel bad about myself. I am worthy. I do have good stuff. Even mm -hmm. if I only sell five or 10,000 books or, you know, a year even. I mean, that's, sure. a, that's a pretty good success. Right? Absolutely. But they don't feel like it because they're not, their name's not in bright lights. Yep. Uh, you know, so how much of that do you get into just kind of shedding uh, false expectations just to help people realize, hey, you know, you're, you're good in and of yourself. The world just puts up a lot of phony stuff. Like, like today, I just saw 50 Cent is bankrupt. Yeah. You know, and they just had an article in the New York Times, New York Post about what a renaissance man he was and his $500 shirts that he bought and he's bankrupt. Uh, yep. What's yeah, going 50 on? cent. That's an interesting one because he also just lost a $5 million lawsuit to one of his baby mamas. Yeah. And then a $17 million lawsuit because he stole somebody's iPhone or, or headphone ideas. Mm. So he has 20, what's that? $21 million in judgments. And did he actually lose his money or is he playing so he doesn't have to pay that back? Right. I don't know. But as a, as a somebody in business, you'd have to ask the question, What's the purpose? Yeah. Maybe he just doesn't want to pay that $21 million. Yep. I, I don't know. But, hey, you know, I guess that's a different topic on, on yeah. business and strategy. But <laughs> Yeah. But either way, I mean, if he lost because if, he, if some of his rise to fame was because he stole an idea, I mean, that's, that's just still another. It's like maybe sure. you're not quite as good as you put yourself out there to be. And I, I totally. guess the main thing is, you know, just everybody has intrinsic value just as being a human being. Right. Yeah. And they just put too much pressure on themselves because they see things, they see others in bright lights. Like, how come I'm not there? I'm just as good, if not better. Mm -hmm. But maybe they didn't just work the system as well as they could. Or work the system or maybe try to understand it. I think if you're coming in as an author and you want to be a New York Times, and am I getting that echo on you as well? 
No. Okay, perfect. If you want to be an author, I think you have to be realistic in where you're coming from. If you're a first-time author, you've never sold a book, you have a fantastic idea, but you position yourself, if I only put this out to the world, somehow, some way, you know, there's one person that's going to see it and find me and make me this, you know, super millionaire and make me a New York Times. It's, it's the needle in the haystack approach. You just have to be honest with what you're doing. You know, we, we know when we go and buy groceries exactly what we're getting. We have an expectation that this corn or this, you know, tomato is ripe because I looked at it. But when you're creating something and you don't know anything about the business model at all, it's just kind of a shot in the dark. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just as long as you have expectations, that's right. Less likely are you going to be found by somebody. But if you spend the time learning the business of why books are sold, now you can have a realistic ex- expectation of what you can do. Uh, it's just kind of how the world works. It, I, I, I wrote a post the other day and I had something, this was a Facebook thing, and I had something about Bill Gates' statement. If, you're, if you were born poor, it's not your fault. If you die poor, it's your fault. Right. And people started replying back to this, like, what do you mean? What's the message of poor? And I'm like, look, if you take this into Bill Gates' perspective, since he put it, you know, last year he donated something like $17 billion, which is the same, and that's to charities and churches, the same amount that it took 358,000 families, because the average family donates $2,900 a year in the U.S. So one person's production, he's looking at it saying, if I don't, If I don't learn my business and I don't be the best provider and make the most that I possibly can, I can't help other people because I have a unique ability. His ability is to, you know, make software and make money. Uh, My ability is something else. But if I'm not at the top of my game and understand my business well, other people that I could help or teach or train or donate to don't get the fruits of my labor because I don't know what I'm getting into. Mm -hmm. So we're always trying to discuss on being really real and honest and learning all sides. We don't want to go in and just gamble our time, our efforts, our money. If we have a calling, like if I'm, if I'm called to serve, if I'm called to do something, it's my responsibility to learn all of that or uh, with all those components that it, it entails Or I'm just kind of leaving it up to chance and I'm just saying, well, I'm only going to half-ass the job, you know, sorry to those people that needed me in the world or needed this, what I could write in my book, this one person that could need my message. I'm sorry you're not worth the time for me to actually learn how to get my message heard or sell my book or Mm -hmm. whatever it is. So studying the business is absolutely crucial to almost anything. Being a coach and a trainer, I had to learn how to communicate to somebody to make, even make somebody like you say, hmm, what is he saying? How, why is he saying this? And, and, and what's the message that's behind it? Because if I just stood in front of my cell phone and blabbered something and I didn't have a flow and a meaning and a, and a, and a kind of a style to it, it wouldn't be as impactful. Right. How do you juggle or separate your personal Facebook with your business Facebook? And, and I see you're doing a lot of paid ads as well. I mean, how do you, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on your Facebook strategy? So with Facebook, if I could do everything off of my personal account, I would, but I can't. We're limited to the amount of people where we can see. Facebook's new algorithm says that if you have you know, if you post a picture, only 10% of your friends that say they want to hear from you will actually even see it. So, but a year ago, we went from, you know, lots of likes and comments and all of a sudden it shrunk down. It's because they're choosing who to show your, your message to. So if I could do the, hate, the Facebook hustle, which is my posts and, and which is basically how much value can I give you before you want to learn more about me, I would, but they won't allow me to. Uh, and Facebook is a super powerful tool for entrepreneurs. So then I built my fan page, uh, there's about 15,000 people that have liked that, which isn't big by any means. It's, it's not easy work to do that. So those people I can communicate to. But if you want to do a paid ad, meaning if I wanted to reach out and find you, which somehow I did, you fit one of my criteria, uh, which probably was this, uh, male in between 30 and about 55 to 60 is my current client. Um, Self-employed by some manner, that could be lower mortgage broker, agent, but said they're self-employed somehow, lots of different names. And then as like Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, or Frank Kern. That was, and I just, I store this stuff in my head. That was, because right. I know when you replied to me, 
That was the ad that I ran. And I, I can kind of dial in who that person is, is that's my perfect client. Now, I had to spend a lot of time figuring out who I can communicate with the best. But once I did that, then I can go through Facebook and do it. But that's the reason I have to do personal and business. And I kind of cross the mix of both. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a really great, another person out there that's a great friend of mine, um, uh, Ryan Stuman, who he sells a program called The Hardcore Closer. And all he does is teach real estate agents and mortgage brokers how to communicate. Mortgage brokers and real estate agents right now are on a frenzy to build a, f- a Facebook fan page because everybody else does without understanding why somebody would come there. I, when I think about selling a home, when I think about my home on a daily basis, the last thing I think about is my real estate agent, although they, they provide a great service. So when a real estate agent can come over the fact that a person isn't really, don't really want to do business with you, not personally, it's not against them personally, but they know it's a necessity to get the best value and the best home done, then all of a sudden they start marketing differently. They realize they're not the commodity, the home is the commodity. So I had to do the same thing with mine. I had to really realize, why would somebody like me? They're not liking my fan page because I have this storefront or because I sell this one program or this one book. They need to be able to come there because they're getting value. I just had to learn how to give that value. To get really honest. And mortgage brokers and real estate agents are the easiest ones for me to explain. Mm. Nobody's going to go there to see all your new listings. Right. But if they go there because they know that, that you know you're a necessity and the fastest way to get from pain, which is selling my house, to feeling better, which is to get it closed, is you, I will hang out with you all day long right. because you get what I'm looking for. Yeah. That's interesting. He calls it the hardcore closer, but it sounds like he's getting – more into the mindset so it becomes an easy close oh it is the more honest that you get the less selling that actually happens Mm -hmm. uh in my in 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 my world you know somebody opts in and then they watch this 45 minute documentary that i that i uh that produced specifically to teach a message and at the end of that somebody comes on and they they fill out a questionnaire it's about 35 questions and these aren't easy i ask people if they have drug problems if they've cheated on their wives how much money they're making, like very aggressive things because I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking for a very specific person. Uh, and at the end of that, I get on a conference call or a call with them uh, should they meet all the criteria. And the first thing I do is tell them exactly what we're on the call for. I'm there to, to learn more about them, to see if they qualify. And at the end of the call, I'm actually going to, if, if, if we all fit and I answered all their questions, I'm going to give them an opportunity to spend some money, invest some time, energy and money come fly to me. I give them the pitch, the money in front, very honest and up front. The reason we're on the call is for these two purposes. I need to get to know you and are you a good qualified fit? And if you are, you're going to spend some money with me. And then I can spend the next 45 minutes or however long it takes just being honest and real with them. And there's no this what's coming, you know, when's the pitch and how much up front and honest and the rest of it is just human nature. We'll just become really good friends. And if it fits, it fits. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But there's no yeah. hidden trap door. Yeah, I love it. I call it close first and then present. There you go. Uh, and one day I will find this. And maybe with your connections, you can help. But there was a, there was a Happy Days episode years ago. And Richie was older. I mean, he might have even been in college, I think. He was still living at home. Uh, and some cute girl comes over to study. And the, as soon as they sit down, the first thing she does is kiss him. And he was like, what's that all about? And she said, I know you'll probably be thinking about, do I like you? Will you get a kiss? And you know, wait till the end of the night. She says, I just want to get it out in the open. Yes, I like you. Here's your kiss. Let's study. And then we'll go on a date later. But he was like, oh, yeah, cool. So then they, they were able to study, right? They were able to relax. That's right. And so I've got to find that episode. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and cause that, that just illustrates exactly what you said, right? Just get it out in the open. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then now, I mean, you're doing a very smart thing. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to downplay it. That documentary is good and the questions are good. So, you know, I mean, people that go through all of that, they're, they're pretty well sold and it's, wouldn't you agree? I mean, it's kind of the icing on the cake at the end because they have self-selected, uh, you know, to be uh, open and receptive, uh, really, to whatever you might offer. Yeah, yeah. I did it the other way in the past, where it was mass 
and I would get some, you know, thousand people to buy a $29 product. And then I would call and start to sort through those, uh, through those calls. But it was falls back to the, you know, the 80, 20 rule of, of marketing. I really needed to find a way for me to find my perfect client. So I put up every roadblock possible, yeah. but then I spend money to send people there. And so that they can choose, um, right. the calls are, are still, you know, the, People are skeptical in this world, and they saw a documentary, and they're like, it is, I really want to fly someplace, and I'm going to spend some time away from my kids. Am I going to get value out of it? That's probably the biggest questions that I have, um, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a very easy sales process, but at the end, it really is. It's, they've qualified themselves, and in about 15 minutes, you know, I, if, if it's not a good fit, I'll stop the call and just say, hey, you know what? We're going to change paths because I know this isn't going to be a right fit for you uh, unless you can tell me otherwise right now. But what I'd really like to do is just help you for the next 20 minutes. Let's right. go down a different path and, you know, I can help you on your way or maybe I can help you find somebody that fits you better because I'm really there just to serve. And if they're a great fit, that's great. But you, you're right. Most of the time I don't get on the calls unless they, yeah. they qualify. And that even comes down to only about 50% of people that submit an application even fill it out. I'd say 50% only fill out maybe 15 questions and they are automatically disqualified. And then I get about 25% that fill it out with one word answers, and those guys get disqualified. And so it's how did they fill it out, and is there in depth, and do they want, which right. is kind of a whole sorting process to figure out. Yeah. How do we get the perfect client? Taking money from the wrong person that doesn't fit your, 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 your skills or your, um, the flow of your company can really – Especially in the coaching world uh, and consulting can really damper even your life. I mean, the stress yeah. and energy that they take on is just wrong. Yeah, I, I see a, a proliferation of these self-proclaimed gurus. I mean, charging twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars, and people that I know are paying it, and I know they really can't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're coming to me. I know this because they're coming to me later saying, "Can you help?" And I'm like. No, you're broke. You know, yeah. like, I, I'm not thirty five thousand dollars for your one year guru ness, but I'm not free either. You sure. know, and now you're you're halfway through this program and you're suffering, and and it's just, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it bums me out. But I mean, people are preying on others on their weaknesses. You know, sure. Uh, and that's so. I mean, it's good to see you're filtering them out and keeping it real. And uh, yeah. I mean, that's awesome. So. Uh, man, this has been fantastic. I want to honor your time here. So you've, uh, but maybe a, a parting word of wisdom, and then I will we'll throw out how people can reach you. Sure. You know, the, the, the real crux of society is just not being honest. I mean, it's, it's just getting as real and honest as possible. Uh, business, or even in your spirituality, your relationship with God, if, if you can get honest you can pretty much create what you want. You can get the clients you want, the customers you want, the family you want. But if you're lying to yourself or others, it's not going to work. Uh, I'd say 80% of our time is spent at one of our academies is just teaching people how to be honest consistently. Mm -hmm. And it's not that people are liars by, by trade. They don't want to. But, you know, we put on a fake facade because we had some problems and we lie. We're right. just good liars. We lie to ourselves. So that's, that's really the only words of wisdom I have for today is to be honest. That's awesome. So wh where should we send people to stay in touch with you and follow you? You know what? Um, for, for the guys out there, uh, awakenthaking.net. Uh, for the girls out there that want to learn more, Facebook. It's Greg W. Anderson. Uh, Awaken the Queen is coming out soon. Oh, nice. Um, Education is different, but I found that if I keep men and women separate, we get much better results. Yep. Um, so just you know, through Facebook is the easiest, and that's, right. again, Greg W. Anderson or awakenthaking.net. All right. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Greg Thank Anderson, the architect enlightening our lives. Hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. Very welcome. Thank you. All right, man. Have a great day. What'd you think, huh? This guy's legit. I love how he uh, left a great job because it was not fulfilling. He didn't feel right, uh, you know, stepping on toes uh, to make his way in this world. And, uh, and that's awesome. He still had to fall on some hard times uh, to understand 
you know, his different strengths and limitations uh, and how to overcome that. You know, uh, he and I are friends on Facebook. I follow uh, everything that he's doing. Uh, he does things like he hangs out with his ex, right? Because she's the mother of his kids uh, and they're making it uh, better, or, you know, or as good as they can for their children. Uh, but this guy is really good at helping you uh, come back from hitting rock bottom. And you know what? I don't think you even have to hit, hit rock bottom uh, to learn from him. All right. So check out uh, the different programs he has. Uh, as always, go back and re-listen to this uh, a couple of times. Make sure you are mastering, you know, the four B's, right? Body, being, business, and balance. Uh, maybe you want to attend his, his uh, awakening program, you know, Awaken the King. Uh, but make sure you are taking time uh, for some silence, right? For some contemplation. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's just some quiet time. Uh, make sure you're filling your head with some good stuff. Uh, I love the way he talks about he reads until he gets an aha and then he goes and applies. Uh, I find myself doing that a good bit as well. Uh, I have a lot of books laying around the house. A lot of them, uh, a lot of them I have read end to end. A lot of them I've read many times. Uh, but a lot of them I'll read and I'll put it down. When I see something, I go do it. Right, and it may be another day. It may be a week. It may be a month before I come back to that book. Because the main thing, the reason you get educated is so you can take the proper action. All right. So I love the way he is all about helping you take action. You can see all the notes and links to everything mentioned at thesaleswhisperer.com slash session 136. Show feedback and guest suggestions are always welcome. Let me know what topics you'd like me to cover and any cool guys or gals you'd like me to interview. Uh, you can hit me up at wes at thesaleswhisperer.com. And if you want some affordable, live, interactive help from me and my team twice a month, check out Marketing Automation Network. Dot com. Even if you don't have an email or a CRM tool running yet, uh, there is no other place on earth where you can get direct access to my team and me to answer your questions and record the answers and give you access to those sessions. You'll get access to the entire archive of sessions going back several years. So head on over to marketingautomationnetwork.com and sign up now. Remember to subscribe to the show, write me a review in iTunes, and I will love you long time. And please tell your friends, all right? The best compliment you can give is to share your feedback with a review and telling your friends about the show. And as always, remember to sell different. <laughs>